Hello, my name is Veronica LeBeau. I'm the Executive Director for the Northern California of the American Liver Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Ask the Experts series webinar presentation of updates and management of chronic liver disease. Our vision is a world without liver disease. And as part of our 2019 educational outreach, we want to thank Drs. Kittis Yamam, Suvik Sakar, Eric Chak, and Alicia Gonzalez Flores for sharing their expertise and to all of you for joining us. We would also like to thank UC Davis and California Pacific Medical Center for their support as well. Before I turn this over to our esteemed speakers, I want to review a few housekeeping points. You can type your questions in the chat section any time during our presentation. We are going to hold off answering them until after the speakers finish. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our national ALF website and our Northern California website under resources and then go to webinars. You can find those links and many other resources listed on the last page of this webinar. Thank you again for attending our Ask the Experts 2019 webinar, and I'm honored to introduce Dr. Kittis Yamam. Um, thanks everyone for joining us uh, for today's webinar um, titled Updates and Management of Chronic Liver Disease. I will introduce the speakers um, today. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Eric Chuck, who is the um, Associate Professor of Medicine um, and a, a hepatologist at UC Davis Medical Center. Um, we also have Dr. Suvik Sarkar, who is um, an Associate Professor of Medicine at UC Davis Medical Center, as well as a hepatologist, um, along with a director of uh, the UC Davis um, GI Fellowship Research Program. We also have Dr. Alicia Gonzalez Flores from UC Davis Medical Center. She's also an associate um, professor of medicine who has extensive experience in treating patients with chronic hepatitis C. I'm also one of the speakers. I'm a transplant hepatologist and the director of autoimmune liver disease program at California Pacific Medical Center, San Francisco, California. Um, we will start with Dr. Eric Chak, who will be giving us updates on management of chronic hepatitis B. Eric? Dr. Chak, you might want to unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to look actually to find the slides. Uh, they're supposed to be in front of me. I have my own copy. I just want to confirm that you'll be advancing. Okay. I will be advancing slides for you, yes. Okay, great. Um, all right, so I'll just start here. Okay, so uh, I will be talking on chronic hepatitis B as an update for 2019. Uh, in terms of the burden of disease, uh, there's quite a few people, uh, millions of people that are affected worldwide, it's 240 million total, uh, leading to 800,000 deaths worldwide. So it's a big problem uh, with that regard. Hepatitis B is a leading cause of cancer as well, uh, which is what we're trying to prevent. In the United States, 850,000 are um, affected, so less than abroad, but um, it's still a significant number. Um, and as a result of hepatitis B and hepatitis C, uh, patients with cirrhosis, this leads to about 340,000 deaths per year. Um, that's with um, all the different liver diseases combined. If we move on to the next slide, there's a, a map actually put out by the CDC that shows us the different um, areas that are affected by uh, chronic hepatitis B. The darker areas um, have higher prevalence, so Southeast Asia, Africa, those are the 
um, main areas that we see um, patients with hepatitis B from. If you um, think about what we're trying to prevent, um, most people have hepatitis B uh, worldwide, again, as a result of vertical transmission. So this is uh, in a situation where mom is not treated um, or screened adequately and the virus is transmitted to the baby. Um, this leads to a chronic infection. Uh, one of the things that's scary about hepatitis B is that uh, you can actually transmit or you can actually develop liver cancer, I'm sorry, without going through cirrhosis initially. So uh, hepatitis B can develop just out of the blue. Um, and of course, this leads to liver transplantation or death. So actually screening people when they're in the chronic infection phase to prevent these bad outcomes is what we're trying to do. Uh, if you look at the history of chronic hepatitis B, uh, there's a lot of different phases that it can actually go into. Initially, uh, we're in what we call the uh, immune tolerant phase. This is where the hepatitis B DNA level is very, very high and the ALT level is normal. Over time, the uh, body recognizes hepatitis B as foreign and starts to attack it. And it does a pretty good job, right? So the DNA level you can see in the diagram starts to decrease. Um, but unfortunately, since hepatitis B lives in the liver cell, um, by destroying the hepatitis B, you actually destroy liver cells as collateral damage. So you see the ALT start to increase as well. Um, over time, uh, there is a period where you reach what we call the inactive chronic hepatitis B phase, where essentially the fighting is over, the, the body has, uh, has beaten the virus, suppressed it. And now the ALT goes back down to normal, um, and the DNA uh, goes to very low levels. Um, a small percentage, um, about 20% uh, of people, may end up going into this immune reactivation phase uh, where the ALT and the DNA starts to rise again. Um, the reason this diagram is important is it really depends on where you are in this natural history, uh, which determines if you need treatment or not. We really only treat when the ALT is elevated. So that would be the immune active phase and also immune reactivation. Uh, a couple of caveats here. Um, in general, um, evidence of liver damage is required for treatment. So for example, even if you met the numeric criteria for treatment, uh, you may not require it because, um, for example, if your liver biopsy is normal or we do uh, a special ultrasound called the fibro scan and it shows no evidence of uh, fibrosis, then perhaps we can wait to see how your liver does. Um, sometimes people flare and then things get better on their own and you don't need treatment. Uh, the second caveat is patients with cirrhosis, they need to be treated if their DNA level, even if it's very low, um, and if the ALT is normal. So if you have cirrhosis and hepatitis B, we treat you regardless. Uh, the reason we want to treat hepatitis B is because we know that a higher hepatitis B DNA level, that is a virus level, is associated with um, more HCC. So uh, the lower we can get your DNA, for example, if we decide to treat, we want to treat you so that your DNA is very, very low, close to zero, to prevent um, hepatitis, or to, to prevent liver cancer. Uh, another benefit of uh, treatment is that it may lead to uh, fibrosis regression. So if you do have fibrosis on your um, on your liver biopsy or fibro scan, if you're treated, uh, we like to think that your fibrosis will regress. And you can see that in this picture, it's a little bit complicated, but the blue bars are, uh, are actually lower levels of liver fibrosis. And if you focus on the top left uh, panel there, um, you can see at baseline, a lot of the uh, patients had higher levels of fibrosis. And as, as time went on in year one and five, the blue bars started to increase. That means that the proportion Patients over time, um, they started having lower levels of fibrosis. That's on treatment. So, to prevent liver cancer and to also um, to also uh, regress your fibrosis or reverse the fibrosis if we can. Uh, one common question that we get is, when can we stop hepatitis B therapy? Um, and it's possible to stop it. Uh, the most established stopping rule is if you have a E antigen that's positive. Um, and we treat you, so you're in that second panel of the diagram, the immune active phase. We treat the hepatitis B, and 
you uh, seroconvert, meaning your E antigen becomes a negative and you develop a E antibody. We can potentially stop therapy if you've been on it for 12 months at a minimum. And while you're on therapy, you had a normal ALT and also an undetectable hepatitis B viral load. So you, you responded very well to treatment. If you seroconvert on it, you can stop therapy potentially. Uh, one caveat, though, is that you cannot have cirrhosis because remember what we said before, if you have cirrhosis of the liver, then you're higher risk for cancer already. So we want to treat you regardless. We cannot stop therapy if you have cirrhosis. Um, the only thing to realize is that the majority of people, 90%, will have a detectable um, hepatitis B DNA level. And some patients, about a third of patients, will actually flare their ALT and require treatment again. There is some newer therapy uh, that shows that um, hepatitis B E antigen negative patients, so these are people who are treated um, but their E antigen is, is already negative to start with. They don't have cirrhosis. There's been some new data to suggest that after four years of therapy, you can also potentially stop antiviral therapy. So this is a study that was done in Germany. Um, again, mostly genotype B patients. So this is not an Asian uh, population. But 62%, uh, so they followed these patients for 144 weeks. 62% remained off therapy. So if the glass is half full for you, your chances are you may remain off therapy at 144 weeks. Um, and an interesting finding that uh, this study found was that four patients in the stoppage group actually became hepatitis B surface antigen negative. So they're actually cured after stopping therapy. And there's a thought that perhaps the um, immune system starts to rev up after the therapy is gone and it tries to defend itself. So potentially that can be a very small benefit, small proportion benefit of patients who stop therapy may actually clear their, their uh, infection altogether. Um, so what do we do for uh, patients with hepatitis B? Well, first of all, um, it starts with uh, monitoring a comprehensive panel, that is the ALT. Um, also a hepatitis B DNA level, this needs to be checked every six to 12 months. Um, other labs, um, that we've mentioned, I want to know your E antigen status and E antibody status as well. Um, in addition, in order to screen for liver cancer, we uh, check an ultrasound. I recommend checking an ultrasound every six to 12 months. And uh, for this, it's generally uh, based on the guideline Asian women 50 years or older and Asian men 40 years or older uh, because um, hepatitis B liver cancer affects men more than women, so we screen men earlier. There is a new medication out, um, it's called uh, alafenamide, so it's related to um, uh, tenofovir. Now, uh, this medication um, is more plasma-stable, so more of it gets into the hepatocyte. Now, uh, the advantage to that is that there's going to be less side effects. Um, so a traditional side effect of tenofovir is uh, kidney and bone side effects. So if you were to take this over time, uh, we find that the, the kidney function is worse, so the creatinine level is slightly more elevated than patients who are not taking tenofovir. Um, and also, uh, the bone density at baseline may be lower in patients who are taking tenofovir. Now, this is a newer formulation. Like I said, it's, it's more plasma stable, so it goes to the parasite directly. You're going to potentially get less kidney and less bone side effects over time. Uh, and uh, this slide here, Again, a little bit of a busy slide, but a couple things on here. These are patients who uh, were switched, actually, from a tenofovir, the older formulation of tenofovir, a tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, to a newer formulation, tenofovir alafenamide, the newer um, uh, medication that I just mentioned. And it does show that um, the bone density actually increases uh, after switching. Um, and in addition, the, the serum creatinine level also um, will, I'm sorry, the, the bone density will increase and then the serum creatinine level will also decrease. The, um, and that's measured by the uh, familiar uh, filtration rate. So we may have these uh, potential benefits of switching patients. Um, in general, what I do is if someone is on tenofovir, we try to switch them over, particularly if they already have maybe a serum, a baseline serum creatinine elevation. Um, or um, if they have osteoporosis or osteopenia that was found on their, um, on their DEXA scan, so their bone mineral density scan.
Um, there was a, a another medication, I'm sorry, in Tecavir, um, that some uh, patients may be on as well that does not have any of the um, side effects of bone and kidney, but may, be, may have an increased risk of lactic acidosis in patients with cirrhosis um, and high amount scores. So uh, the take-home points here is that um, hepatitis B is endemic to Asia and Africa, so we always say screen uh, these patients um, from these regions and their family members for chronic hepatitis B. Uh, and we do that by checking a hepatitis B service antigen level. After you're diagnosed with hepatitis B, uh, we say check an ALT and a hepatitis B DNA level every 6 to 12 months. So that complicated diagram that we showed at the beginning uh, about the natural history of chronic hepatitis B, um, that will help to guide therapy. We only really treat if the ALT is elevated. Um, Tenofovir disoprostol fumarate, that's TDF, has been shown to decrease fibrosis and may decrease HCC, but has been associated with uh, bone and kidney side effects. Uh, we can consider stopping therapy um, if in the antigen negative patients without fluorescence after four years of treatment. I should also mention that in E antigen patients, E antigen positive patients can be, can be stopped on therapy as well if they seroconvert while on therapy. Um, and lastly, a newer development for hepatitis B is this new medication, tenofovir alafenamide, may help to reverse the bone and kidney side effects that are associated with the older version of tenofovir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eric Chuck, for your great talk. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Gonzalez, and she will be covering chronic hepatitis C updates on diagnosis and treatment. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, if we can uh, fast forward to the next slide. Um, so the following presentation is geared towards patients and caregivers. Um, if a slide is marked with a stethoscope in the right upper corner, the information contained in that particular slide uh, might be more useful for, care, for healthcare providers, but I will do my best to try and summarize that information in a way that's easy to understand for patients as well. <clears throat> Hopefully by the end of this session, you will be able to understand who should be screened for chronic hepatitis C, um, how to diagnose chronic hepatitis C, um, understand the evaluation uh, needed to treat uh, patients with hepatitis C, uh, understand the staging of liver disease, and have a general sense of the different treatment options that are available for patients with hepatitis C, and understand the follow-up of patients who have achieved cure and know when to refer a patient to a specialist. Next slide. Um, just to give you a sense of the natural history of hepatitis C, um, once a patient has been exposed to hepatitis C, um, it, it, there is a 20% or so chance that your body will clear it on its own. Um, however, unfortunately, about 80% of the patients do go on to develop chronic hepatitis. Um, of those patients, about 20 uh, to 30 percent will develop cirrhosis, and I will go into a little more detail what cirrhosis is later on. Uh, this takes about 20 to 25 years, um, and a total of about 30 years to develop HCC. Locally, um, only a very small percentage of patients develop HCC, uh, but those that have cirrhosis have the highest chance of developing um, liver cancer with a chance of about 2 to 7 percent per year. Next slide. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so who do we screen for um, hepatitis C? Uh, these are the different uh, recommendations from the United States Preventative Services Task Force and the CBC. Uh, so the people who should be screened are those who have ever injected illegal drugs, even if it was a one-time thing, um, they should be screened. Uh, patients who received uh, clotting factor concentrates before 1987. Um, anyone has ever been on chronic hemodialysis, um, and anyone has persistently abnormal um, alanine aminotransferase levels. Those are uh, liver enzyme levels. It's a blood test. Um, patients that had a blood transfusion or receive an organ transplant before 1992, uh, any healthcare or emergency medical or public safety worker after a needle stick um, or any type of mucosal exposure to uh, blood that's positive for hepatitis C. Um, 
if it is not known whether the blood was positive for hepatitis C, anyone that has ever had a needle stick should be tested. Um, children born to women who have hepatitis C, uh, and uh, particularly important adults born dur during 1945 to 1965, this is what we call the birth cohort, um, and they should receive at least a one-time testing for hepatitis C, even if they don't have any of the uh, above-mentioned risk factors. Next slide. If we can move on to the next slide. So how do we test for hepatitis C? Um, oh, uh, that's a little fast. Um, go back. So there is a there is a uh, blood test that you can have done to test for hepatitis C, um, or a um, some uh, um, clinics or uh, or health fairs might offer the Aura Quick test, which is a small prick of the finger um, that will allow you to have a result within 20 minutes. Uh, the blood test that the doctors run in the office does take a few days to come back, um, so that's one of the one of the disadvantages. Uh, but they're about the same in terms of um, how good they are about detecting um, hepatitis C. So what the test uh, checks for is um, a hepatitis C antibody. An antibody is kind of like the memory cells that your body has of it being exposed to the infection. Um, so if uh, if uh, the test is negative, um, that's good news. That means uh, you've never been to uh, you've never been exposed to hepatitis C. However, if the test um, is positive, um, that means that you at some point might have been exposed to hepatitis C. Um, as I said earlier, there is about a 20% chance that uh, a patient will clear the infection on their own. Um, but even with clearance of the infection, the uh, antibody, which as I said is the memory cells in the body, will remain positive. So a positive uh, hepatitis C antibody does not mean that you have the infection. It just means that you need follow-up testing after that. So if a patient has a positive antibody, the next test that should be checked is a viral load. If the viral load is uh, negative or not detectable, that means that the patient does not have hepatitis C. If the viral load is positive, that means that the patient is probably infected. Um, if the risk factor for infection occur within the last six months, again, there's still a, a chance that the patient might clear it. So I would suggest rechecking within six months. Um, same if the test is negative, but the, the risk factor um, is within six months, I would still re recommend rechecking um, in, uh, in the next six months. Um, next slide. The, the following slide is uh, basically the same thing that I said in this in this past slide. It's just more of an algorithm that care providers can use uh, for checking patients with hepatitis C. And it's, uh, as, as I said, the same thing is if a, if a patient has a positive antibody, it should be followed up with a um, viral load to confirm the infection. <clears throat> if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so after a patient has been diagnosed with hepatitis C, uh, the next test that is recommended is determining the genotype. The genotype is uh, the genetics of the virus. Um, there's six different genotypes. Um, in the U.S., the most common ones are genotype 1 through 4. Um, there's about 75% of patients that have genotype 1. About 10% um, of patients have genotype 2, um, about other 10% of patients have genotype 3, and about 5% of patients have genotype 4. Um, genotype 5 and 6 are not as common in the U.S., although I do have some patients that have that genotype, they are less common. Next slide. Um, once a patient becomes chronically infected with hepatitis C, um, the way I explain it to patients is that the the infection injures the liver, um, and just like when you cut yourself and a scar forms, scars can form in the liver. Um, there's four different stages of scarring, stage one through four, stage four being the most advanced. Stage one, there is very minimal to no scarring. Stage two, there's moderate scarring. Stage three, there's severe scarring. And stage four, again, is the most advanced, and we call that cirrhosis of the liver. Again, anyone that has um, chronic hepatitis C, there is about a 20 to 30% chance of going on to developing cirrhosis, and that takes about 20 to 25 years from the time they were infected. 
Next slide. Patients that have um, older comorbidities have a higher chance of progressing of, or um, developing scarring. Um, the, it, the way that we used to check for how much scarring a patient had used to be by doing a liver biopsy. Um, so they would have a needle uh, go through the liver, taking a small sample and sending it to the laboratory, and that would help us determine how much scarring there was in the liver. We tend to not do those anymore. There's different ways in which in which we can determine how much scarring the patient has by looking at by doing an exam in the office, doing blood tests to check um, the liver function. Uh, and uh, most recently, another test that's non-invasive was developed that's similar to an ultrasound. If we can forward to the next slide. Uh, this test is a fibro scan. Um, it's very similar to an ultrasound. So they put some jelly in the abdomen. They use a plastic probe to um, send some sound waves through the skin into the liver. Um, and that gives us a sense of how stiff the liver is and therefore how much scarring there is. So non-invasive, uh, very easy to do. Um, not a lot of uh, medical centers have it, so only some centers have it. So you would have to talk to your doctor to make sure that the center that you're affiliated with have access to this specific testing. Um, and again, the results can help us determine whether um, you have stage one, two, three, or four. Next slide. So um, after you have been diagnosed with chronic hepatitis C and um, you have uh, uh, gotten a test to determine the genotype uh, and determine the level of scarring, um, knowing whether you have been treated in the past uh, for hepatitis C or never been treated can help us determine what type of treatment uh, we can use for you. Next slide. So um, who do we treat? Um, so that, that will depend on who will benefit the most, mostly everyone. Uh, but trying to determine who to treat first will be dependent on um, how much scarring the patient has or so the degree of liver fibrosis, who is at risk for more rapid progression, so those who have um, who are co-infected uh, with HIV or hepatitis B, um, other liver disease uh, present, like uh, patients that have fatty liver disease on top of hepatitis C, patients who have manifestations outside of the liver, and those who are at high risk for transmission, for example, those who are actively using drugs. Um, who do we not treat? Uh, you know, the, the guidelines say treat everyone unless the, their life expectancy is less than 12 months. But again, uh, physicians or treating providers will have to use their clinical judgment with this. So um, treatment for hepatitis C has evolved quite significantly. Prior to 2010, uh, main options were uh, injectables or interferon-based uh, regimens. They were not very effective, um, so less than 50% chance of getting cure with that. Uh, and they were very, very toxic, kind of like chemotherapy. That's what, the way I explain it to patients. Um, after 2010, oh, they started developing more oral options. And starting in 2014, um, the development of sofosfovir, or Sobaldi, that's the trait name, and semeprovir or Olisio, uh, really changed the way that we treat hepatitis C. These are um, called direct acting antivirals, and they work directly on the virus to prevent it from replicating. And if a virus can't replicate, then um, it will die and uh, uh, it, will be, it, it will be curable. Um, so in 2014, these agents were developed and have become the backbone of most of the therapies that are available now. Uh, next slide. So the current drug, uh, drug classes um, that are available are act in three different sites of the virus, uh, the NS5B, um, NS3, uh, NS3 site, or the, uh, which is a protease inhibitor, and then NS5A. So they work on these specific parts of the virus, and again, it prevents it from replicating. Next slide. So the next couple of this, this next slide uh, might be very overwhelming with information, but again, I will try to make them as, as digestible as possible. Um, this next slide shows the uh, a site that can be very, very useful to providers. Uh, if we can advance the slide. <coughs> 
um, this site, uh, uh, hcvguidelines.org, um, which is um, done by the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases and the Infectious Disease Society of America, has um, the most up-to-date recommendations for testing, managing, and tre treating hepatitis C. It has um, a lot, a lot of information uh, for healthcare providers, and it provides information based on the genotype of the patient and whether they're when, whether they are treatment naive, that means they've never been treated, or whether they're treatment experienced. Um, and it also provides all the uh, experimental and literature um, and medical evidence to support the different treatment options. So for the healthcare providers um, in the audience, these are really great sites that can um, really help, the, help determine which options are um, available for patients based on their genotype and whether they have been treated and the degree of fibrosis. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Um, in general, to um, kind of try and summarize the information that is in that site, um, the current treatment length uh, for patients with chronic hepatitis C is between 8 and 12 weeks. Uh, most regimens are fixed dose, that means one pill, so they combine multiple medications into one pill um, or three pills. Um, cure rates are very similar uh, for patients that don't have cirrhosis and who have never been treated. Uh, we're talking about 98% um, cure rate. So the way I say to patients is that if you have 100 people that have hepatitis C and they take this these medications, 98 of them will likely get cured. So these are pretty good chances of getting cured with the newer regimens. And again, very, very tolerable. Uh, with very little side effects. Uh, monitoring is very similar for uh, non cirrhotic patients. Uh, the most common treatment options that you might hear about, and these are in not specific order, um, are uh, Mavrids. I have the pictures here because I think it's easier for people to remember when they see pictures. Mavrid is um, a medication that is, we call it pangenotypic. That means you can use it for any genotype. Um, it's uh, three tablets that patients have to take uh, with food once a day um, for either eight weeks uh, or 12 weeks. The, um, the length of treatment will be determined by the amount of scarring the patient has. Um, the other option is a medication called Epclusa. Um, this one is a sofosfovir based medication. It's one tablet once a day uh, for either uh, for 12 weeks um, in patients that have either cirrhosis or not cirrhosis. And then Harboni, uh, which is one of the first medications that was de developed, uh, which is also sofosfovir based. It's also one tablet once a day uh, for either eight weeks to 12 weeks. And there's uh, a few other options that I don't um, have in this, but these are the most common ones that you will hear about. Again, the treatment rates are, um, the cure rates are very similar, very similar amongst all of them. Um, and the side effects are also very similar. So we're talking about some fatigue, some nausea, uh, mild headaches that usually don't require treatment. Uh, most patients are able to work and do their daily activities uh, while on treatment, which is very different than interferon. Uh, during the during, uh, while the patient is on therapy, uh, they do have to come into the clinic to uh, uh, ensure that they're doing okay, uh, or even just a telephone uh, call uh, to make sure that they're doing okay and they're not missing their medications. Uh, blood tests, uh, we definitely re uh, ask that they get some blood tests to begin with, a blood count, a liver panel with kidney function, um, and a test to check the synthetic function of the liver. After four weeks of therapy, we check a viral load. Um, most patients will have an undetectable viral load by week four. Uh, and um, usually, um, you can uh, check treat, you can check blood tests at the end of treatment. You don't necessarily have to for patients who are um, uncomplicated uh, without cirrhosis and that have um, never been treated. We won't, we don't really know if a patient achieves cure, um, that's SVR, which is sustained biological response, until 12 weeks after the end of treatment. So for a patient who followed a 12-week regimen, um, at 24 weeks, that means 12 weeks after the end of treatment, we would check another viral load. If it remains undetectable, we consider that a cure or that they have achieved SBR. We do recommend that patients get tested again um, within a year with another viral load, and definitely if they have risk factors for reinfection. 
so if they're continuing to use drugs or they have been exposed to somebody that um, has a hepatitis C. You might need more frequent monitoring if you are using medications that contain a protease uh, inhibitor or if the patient has cirrhosis or if we're using um, a medication called ribavirin. Next slide. <clears throat> So how do we decide which medication to use? Um, it depends on the side effect profile and what the, but the patient is able to tolerate. But again, the side effects are usually very tolerable. And I say to patients, it's only eight weeks um, to a 12 weeks at, mo at most. Drug-drug um, interactions, so what medications the patient is taking and uh, whether, they're, um, whether they interact with the hepatitis C treatment that we're looking at, um, how many pills the patient is already taking, how many medications, and how many more they're able to take, um, and what other medical conditions they have. For example, they have um, kidney dysfunction, as some medications are cleared by the kidney. Um, do they have uh, seizures, for example, as a lot of anti-epileptics tend to interact with the hep C medications? And everything else being equal, we look at what the insurance will cover, what's in their formulary, uh, and the price of the medication. Um, this is something that the, the physician uh, um, looks at, not, not the patient necessarily. After the patient has achieved cure, if they don't have um, advanced uh, fibrosis, I mean, they don't have a lot of scarring, so they're stage one or two. The follow-up uh, is the same, the same as if they were never infected with hepatitis C. Um, if they have cirrhosis and they need more uh, regular follow-up uh, to ensure they don't develop liver cancer, because even though they've reached a cure, there's still a very small chance that they could potentially develop liver cancer. Um, Assessment of recur recurrence or infection uh, is recommended if the patient has ongoing risk factors for hep C or, other, or has um, abnormalities in their liver test, um, in, in which case uh, a viral load would be recommended rather than a, uh, an antibody. An antibody will always be positive if you have been exposed to hepatitis C, no matter um, whether you're cured or you cleared your on your own. Uh, so we always recommend a viral load to test for uh, reinfection. And this is a very uh, important point as a lot of patients that have been cured um, get tested with an antibody and then they call and they say, you know, I was told I'm positive, I thought I was cured. And it turns out that the positive test was an antibody. And again, this, this is always going to be positive. So what we want to test is a viral load. Next slide. <clears throat> um, if the patient continues to have abnormal liver enzymes after reaching a cure or SVR, then um, we would want to ensure other causes of liver disease have been ruled out. Next slide. So when do we refer patients? Um, if the patient has, uh, so uh, so this, this um, talk I usually do for patients, uh, for primary care doctors, um, because I, I believe primary care doctors can treat hepatitis C, and in fact, I'm a primary care doctor that treats hepatitis C. Um, but if a patient uh, has failed multiple regimens, um, then at that point, I would recommend uh, referring to a hepatologist or somebody that has a lot of experience treating patients with hepatitis C. Patients who are co-infected with HIV or, or hepatitis B uh, uh, would benefit from seeing a special uh, patients who have decompensated cirrhosis, um, or patients that have some renal impairment, uh, particularly if, you, if uh, the healthcare providers don't feel comfortable managing some of the medications that um, are um, uh, renally cleared. So those would be the patients that I would recommend referring. Next slide. Um, so just a, a few take-home points uh, about hepatitis C. Uh, we want to screen uh, anyone that has risk factors or anyone that was born between 1945 or 1965 with an antibody test. Um, if that's positive, then the next step would be a viral load. Uh, and if positive, followed by a genotype and uh, some sort of staging test to determine the degree uh, of uh, scar. And there's many options for treatment. They're all uh, very effective at curing hepatitis C with very little side effects. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, 
for such an excellent talk on management of uh, chronic hepatitis C. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Suvik Sarkar, and he will be covering updates on the management of fatty liver disease. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks. So, and my name is Sovik Sarkar. I am a liver specialty um, out here at UC, um, uh, at UC Davis. So, um, and it is truly a, it is a pleasure to, uh, to have everyone of you out here. So, and my, like, and my talk is going to be focused on fatty liver disease or, or like this otherwise called um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or um, NASAL. As you as you know, right now it is an like this uh, like this a national crisis. We have almost seventy five to hundred million individuals who have um, NASAL in this country. And uh, and if we look um, and and if we look amongst children, almost ten percent of all children also are showing signs of fatty liver disease or NASAL. So so certainly this has. Um, this has um, generated a lot of interest and a lot of importance to try and understand this disease and to try and help um, help um, help treat this um, disease. Over the next few slides, I'll try to go over some of the basics of um, of the disease. So, um, next slide, please. So, uh, and go over the disease. Go over the. Uh, like this, go over why NASAL happens, how um, how is the disease spectrum, and those kind of things. And then I will touch on the management, and I will also show one slide on the future, uh, uh, like of the future, um, of the future um, treatment options that might come um, in the um, in the very near future. So the development of NASAL, as can be seen in this cartoon, it can be multiple factors, not just one single factor. Uh, lifestyle, which includes diet as well as the lack of lack of exercise, it seems to be um, the most common cause which can um, lead to fatty liver disease. Epigenetic factors such as maternal diet, environment seems to also affect it. And in certain and in certain ethnic groups, um, genetic factors have also been implicated to lead to fatty liver disease in the absence of obesity. So as you see, there are there are there are two separate arrows out here. Uh, one that leads towards obesity, which can lead to fatty liver disease, and again, the other one, which is the bottom arrow, which can which can um, lead to fatty liver disease, uh, um, independent of um, like of uh, of a high body mass index. And one thing to keep in mind out here, and that's important, is that NASAL is not just a liver disease, but it is a disease of the entire body because uh, because a large number of the fatty liver disease patients actually uh, actually uh, like and they can and and may suffer from cardiovascular disease, which is the most common uh, um, the most common um, like this effect of nasal. And also, these patients might also have insulin sensitivity as well as a type two diabetes mellitus, and and they can have interlinked disease, of which one of them is PCOS or primary, uh, 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 like this, uh, or like this, or in the patients who have, uh, like this, who have, um, and the like this, and the polycystic um, ovarian uh, syndrome, they can also have fatty liver disease. Um, next slide, please. So out here, I'm showing you the nasal spectrum. So the nasal or the fatty liver disease, as I said, the spectrum out here, in, um, these, these shows a series of uh, liver biopsies. So, so, so just to walk you through it, and, just, and I put up these pictures just so that all of you uh, basically get the feeling that, that like this, what is going inside your liver at this point of time in someone who has fatty liver disease. So almost 70 to 75% of the patients of fatty liver disease will form uh, will fall in the first um, in the first picture, which is on uh, steatosis alone, or isolated hepatic steatosis. Now that in itself is not that not that um, dangerous, but of course, um, a quarter or a fifth of those patients can 
uh, can start developing inflammation. And that is shown in the second picture. When you start developing inflammation, as you can imagine, inflammation can lead to the development of scar tissue, as can be seen in the pictures on the um, in the right two columns. Which and that said, so and that, as you can see on top, it is it is it says a twenty percent that, and that means almost uh, like there's almost one out of every five of the of the NASH. Now I brought in a a new term out here, which is called um, NASH or non-alcoholic state of hepatitis. So these are patients with fat in the liver and with inflammation. So that's what the hepatitis would stand for. So, so a fifth of those NASH patients can progress to fibrosis. And as you can see, a lot of scar tissue, which is um, cirrhosis or stage four five, five, fibrosis. Um, next slide, please. So, um, so in terms of you know, uh, I think it's important to start to understand is I don't know why is it important? Why why is the fat, the inflammation, and the fibrosis important in these patients? Well, it's important because it can have direct um, linkage to how these patients do overall. So there have been multiple studies done in large population based um, studies, and they found that the mortality risk, the risk for death of with fatty liver disease versus a patient having some inflammation or NASH is significantly increased in those with inflammation or fibrosis. And of course, the most common cause of a patient getting sick was cardiovascular disease, as well as other extra hepatic, um, like this cancers or malignancies. And of course, 19% uh, uh, of those will suffer from liver disease. The other more important thing to, to, to also keep in mind, next slide please, uh, is the fibrosis. So this is a very nice study, which kind of showed that fib fibrosis, so development of any fibrosis is an independent predictor of increased um, damage or, or increased risk for of not such good outcomes uh, um, in the patient. So what this slide shows on the top is the absence of any fibrosis as you start developing more and more fibrosis. And of course, the presence of fibrosis shown in that red line, it is the worst outcome. And on the right, you see the table and you can see it right away. You don't need to be you know, told that as the patient start developing stage two, you had 7.1% um, liver related events and then the hazard ratio, which is how much is the risk for that is 7.5 times. And that significantly goes up to 13.8 and 47.5 times with stage four. So definitely something, uh, something to sit up and take, uh, and, take, um, um, and take some attention on. So next slide, please. So how do, we, how do we go about to diagnose and manage this patient? So diagnosis of NASA incorporates clinical history which is um, race, weight, BMI, comorbidities, um, laboratory data, LFTs, ALT, A1, C lipid panel, serum markers for fibrosis, um, radiographic data, ultrasound, fiber scan, MRI, and I'll show you some, and, and the liver biopsy if available. So one thing do keep in mind, I put in all these parameters out here because, because fatty liver is not a simple slam dunk diagnosis that, oh, you have fat in the liver on the ultrasound. Yes, it is. I mean, so... So that's the good thing that you have fat in the liver, but does it matter to the patient? Does it start, uh, can it have increased risk to the patient? So that's where you really need to take a look at the, at the entire picture and not just one single aspect, um, aspect of it. So um, next slide, please. So I will try to you know, walk through each of the aspects. So the first aspect, you know, I will, uh, you know, in terms of the history, as you can know, as I just went through it on the on the second slide, we need to know about the gen, like the ethnicity, the risk, and think, uh, and the lifestyle, the diet. But then comes the labs. So the next part of the labs is the ALT in the patient. I think that's the most important question that seems to come up. That the patient's ALT is not high, so the patient does not have um, NASH, or the patient does not have inflammation, and that is uh, actually wrong. 
because this was a nice study which showed that as you can see the the um, the different bars you'll see that in patients like if you if you if you look at um the the bar diagram b c and d you'll see that half of the patients who had inflammation they didn't and they had a normal alt half of the patient who had fibrosis had a normal alt so truly speaking that's a major number so yes it is not a good tool to screen for fatty liver disease with inflammation or fibrosis but that's what we have at this point of time as one of the tools so next slide please there has been um, numerous studies to look at what can we what can we make use of from serum markers as a selected serum markers for for fib fibrosis and the reason i put on fibrosis because that seemed to be one of the major indicators of of like this uh, of like this worse disease outcome but that said you have to keep in mind we are not looking at inflammation here but more at the fibrosis and they have all these different scores the fit for apri uh, came from the days of hepatitis c the, and then and now they have the nasal fibrosis score the els score as you can see there are multiple scores at this time you know it's everyone's choice what they want to make use of um, there are different um, guidelines and i will go to one of them and fit for it seems to, it is it is a freely like this a freely available tool it is available online it is available on the app and it is a tool which anyone can can make use of on their day to day practice so i do recommend that uh, current imaging tools for nasa so next slide so the current imaging tools for nasal can detect steatosis and fibrosis but not inflammation um so so the first one is ultrasound right because that is the most point of care tool you can detect steatosis can be useful for screening if sensitivity remains low the steatosis it can detect more than 20% when there is at least 20% of fat in the in the liver it is getting it is improving but definitely that's what it is the fibro scan it is it is ultrasound based the fibro as 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 you just saw in dr in uh, in dr gonzales's talk the steatosis it can detect more than 10% um, there is a special software called the cap and uh, but it is limited by bmi and significant alt elevation and that's something you have to keep in mind because a large number of these patients can actually have that so you have to have to keep that limitation in your mind and then and then mri the most sensitive fibrosis it can detect with mr elastography steatosis by proton density fat fraction to up to 4 to 5% um liver fat it is expensive and it has limited availability um next slide all right so now i'll try to incorporate uh, some of the aspects that we discuss into 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 basically clinical care and how we try to find this is from one of the world experts in fatty liver disease and and what they suggested was you know first when you see the patient evaluate for alcohol consumption confirmation of fatty liver disease based on your history exclude alternate causes of alt elevations like you know hep c hep b and then and then you try to and and, and you try to um risk stratify this patient so low low risk profile as you can see um younger patients low bmi no type 2 diabetes non invasive fibrosis estimation the fit for are less than 1.3 so that really comes in use out there if you have a fibro scan and you and you feel you have you know your 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 and your center does good fibro scan you can make use of that also so you follow the patient you tell tell them to lose weight and stuff like that and we can talk about the management and you follow intermediate risk so the bmi is high age is higher the fit for score is between 1.3 to the two out it is 2.67 some of the other guidelines will say 3.25 so again those are still out there there is no guidelines per se but there are some guidance you may or may not consider a liver biopsy you cannot do liver biopsy in, in all of these patients it is not you know it's not it's not affordable and then ast then the high risk profile you start thinking does the patient have cirrhosis so that's where it comes in that you definitely want to consider other conf confirmatory testing 
with with MRE or or other tools. So the now coming to the next part of it, treatment options. So treatment options now that we have the uh, have the diag diag diagnosis understanding, we have stratified treatment options can be divided uh, broadly more into weight loss, which is diet and exercise, uh, bariatric surgery is one option, uh, uh, um, gastric balloon in some patients, very select patients, and medication, NASH, which are current, and I'll talk very briefly on emerging for the, for the interest of um, time. So next slide, please. So weight loss. So weight loss, it has been shown, um, like this good data has shown that loss of at least 5% of uh, body weight had improvement in liver fat. 7% body weight reduction was associated with ketosis and inflammation improvement. And more than 10% weight loss was associated with improvement in all features of NASH, including inflammation and fibrosis. So definitely a very important achievement. Okay, next. Now, now coming to diet. Uh, prospective trials comparing various diet which can, be, which can be beneficial in NAFL patients are limited. We know what are bad, right? I mean, that is very, pretty much clear. But really, there is no, 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 no definite trial which those are. But it has been shown that decreasing caloric intake by at least 30%, it results in improvement of the liver fat. In some studies, uh, the, the Mediterranean diet has shown significant improvement in the, uh, in the fat in the liver as well. Exercise. How much exercise is good? You will get to hear that a lot. So the optimal duration and intensity of exercise remains again undetermined, but the data suggests that patients who maintain physical activity more than 150 minutes per, 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 uh, per week, so you can imagine 30 minutes a day, five days a week, has been uh, shown to lead to improvement of the liver enzymes. So you, so you have to keep in mind again with the ALT, just to keep in the, in the context, if the ALT is high, you probably have liver inflammation. So if the ALT is getting better with your intervention, you are probably helping significantly to reduce that inflammation. So that's one thing to, 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 to basically keep in mind in, in these patients. Um, next slide. Again, some, uh, something that comes up, how much alcohol should the patient drink or should, or my patients would ask that how much alcohol should we drink? Again, there is no definite consensus on this, but truly, I mean, you want to make sure based on the stage of the liver disease, if you have a stage four, you definitely cannot afford any chances, a, a, stage, a stage three or four um, rather, and I personally would say is best to avoid. But, but, but otherwise, depending again on the level of interaction you have, heavy alcohol use should be avoided, and this is from the ASLD guidance paper, and by heavy, we are going to hear in the in the next part, so I'll not go in detail, but you know, heavy alcohol has been defined by the National Institute of, of Alcohol Addiction. So more than 14 standard drinks for men and seven standard drinks for women. So uh, so that's what. Um, the current regimens, there are no current FDA approved uh, regimens. Um, below are some ASLD guidance statements based on available data. Metformin is not recommended for treating NASH, but it has a benefit in helping control diabetes and also in the patients can also lose weight on that. So something to keep in mind in, in diabetic patients, it can form a first line of treatment uh, in, in some of the patients. Pio Pioglitazone or Actos, it improves liver histology in NASH patients. Therefore, it may be used to treat these patients. Benefits and risks should be discussed, which includes weight gain, bone loss. Again, pioglitazone, as of now, as per the guidance, should not, uh, should, should not be used to treat NAFL without biopsy proven on NASH. Next slide. Vitamin E, as we know, um, is is the most wide, uh, wide, wide, widespread used medication at this point of time. At but because the study showed that at 800 international units per day, it improves liver histology in non-diabetic adults with biopsy proven AMNASH. The risk and benefits should be discussed. Associated with increased risk for prostate cancer and and increased risk for bleeding. At this time. Vitamin E is not recommended to treat NASH in diabetic patients. And 
um, nasal patients without liver biopsy and NASH on cirrhosis. But again, you know, and, and this is something to keep in mind. This is the guidance. You know, we of course cannot biopsy everyone, and I and 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 many of the patients will probably be on be on vitamin E without biopsy proven um, NASH. Okay, next slide. So now coming to the current therapies in phase three trials, and this this is a disclosure again. Basically, these are studies which are not approved. So these are in clinical trials, and these are the phase three uh, clinical trials. We have elafibrinor, obeticolic acid, sensibiroc, and salon sertib. Uh, only the Stella three study is active. The Stella four has been closed at this time. And I'll not go into the details about the mechanism of action just for the sake of time, but but basically these are all ongoing studies at this point of time. Some some take home points. NASA affects nearly a third of the nation's population, as I showed you. Cardiovascular disease is a major comorbidity. Advanced fib fib fibrosis may need may need specialty care, and these patients should be referred to hepatology early on. Weight loss with healthy diet and, and exercise remains the mainstay of therapy in a majority. Puglitosin and vitamin E are potential therapies that come with associated uh, risk. And I showed you some new therapies are in the horizon, and there are quite a few. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk, and I would like to hand over to Dr. To, uh, to Dr. Kiddis Imam. She is the Director of Autoimmune um, Diseases at the California Pacific Medical Center. And she's a transplant uh, and a transplant hepatologist. Uh, thank, um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Sarkar, for the introduction and for the nice um, summary on NASL in management of NASH. Um, my talk today will cover alcoholic liver disease with a focus on management of acute alcoholic hepatitis. Um, so through the presentation, I would like to answer the following questions. Uh, question number one, which comes up all the time, is how much is al how much alcohol is really too much? Um, Dr. Sarkar has commented on this early on. Uh, number two, what's the natural history of alcoholic liver disease? Meaning, is everyone that drinks alcohol will progress to chronic liver disease or not? Um, number three, I will um, review what acute alcoholic hepatitis is in the available treatment options. And finally, I will comment on the role of liver transplant in a setting of severe acute alcoholic hepatitis. Next slide. So when associated with alcohol dependence, the burden of alcohol on health is actually enormous. In fact, a survey then performed in 2013 in the US mentioned or reported that over 50% of uh, Americans aged above 12 reported drinking alcohol at some point, which equal, I'm sorry, uh, they reported drinking alcohol currently, which equals actually 169 136 million current drinkers in that year. Uh, when they looked at people that drink heavily, um, it was 6.3% of the population, which equaled 16 million people in that year. Heavy drinking, by definition, was drinking, binge drinking, at least five days in the last 30 days. Um, per data from the WHO, um, alcohol consumption actually does account for 3.8% uh, global mortality as well as 4.6% disability. In Europe, this problem seems to be a bit more, more uh, with a 6.5% death attributed to alcohol use per year. When you look at harmful drinking, it's actually responsible for one in seven deaths in male, in one in 13 days in women aged 15 to 60, um, 64. Next slide. In the US, alcoholic liver disease actually is the eighth 
most common cause cause of all uh, cause mortality in per data from United Network for organ sharing. You know, so alcoholic liver disease actually accounts for up to 20% of transplant performed in the U.S. either alone or in combination with chronic hep C between years 1988 and 2009. Percentages of new listing for liver transplant and also patients receiving liver transplant for alcoholic liver disease currently is on the right. Next slide, please. So what is considered a drink, a drink meaning one drink um, per, one drink per definition contains about 14 grams of alcohol. And what does that translate into? One drink, i.e. 14 grams of alcohol translates into a 12 ounce of beer or a five ounce of uh, wine, which is 12% in alcohol content, or a 1.5 ounces of uh, uh, distilled spirits, which are roughly about 40% of alcohol. Next slide, please. And what is really considered at risk or heavy, heavy drinking? So again, as mentioned by Dr. Sarkar, uh, per National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, the definition varies per gender. For men, it is over four drinks on a given day and not more than 14 drinks per week. Uh, for women, it is three drinks on a given day and not more than seven drinks per week. Please note that to stay low risk, both uh, within both single day as well as per week um, limits um, have to be achieved. Next slide, please. Certainly, the amount of the amount as well as duration of alcohol use determines the risk of developing cirrhosis, i.e., chronic liver disease. However, um, underlining individual risk factors including gender, ethnicity, genetic variability in terms of susceptibility to alcohol injury, as well as socioeconomic status, as well as comorbid medical condition one may have, which include metabolic syndrome, i.e. fatty liver disease, chronic hep C, chronic hep B, malnutrition, as well as other diseases such as hemochromatosis, do certainly play a role and the risk of developing um, chronic liver disease, i.e. cirrhosis from alcohol use. Next slide, please. What are the different stages of progressive liver injury from alcohol? As seen on this slide, um, the first picture shows a cross-section of a healthy liver. Um, with ongoing alcohol use, um, with significant alcohol use, roughly 90 plus percent of patients can actually develop fatty uh, infiltration of the liver, um, often over 60 grams of alcohol per day um, in a setting of chronic use. If so, that actually develop uh, fat infiltration of the liver, about 10 to 35 percent actually will develop acute alcoholic hepatitis, which we will review in the next few slides. With ongoing alcohol use, one can also develop chronic liver disease, um, I'm sorry, chronic uh, fixed liver disease, i.e. cirrhosis, and about 8 to 20 percent of those that had um, alcoholic hepatitis. Once people develop cirrhosis, there is a risk of liver cancer, usually 1 to 2 percent per year. There is also a risk of liver decompensation, i.e. development of hepatic encephalopathy, portal hypertension with variceal bleeding, as well as ascites, and about 20 to 40 percent of cirrhotics with ongoing alcohol use. Next slide, please. So what is alcoholic hepatitis? As we stated earlier, roughly 10 to 35% of patients with 
significant alcohol use may develop acute alcoholic hepatitis. Alcoholic hepatitis is a serious form of acute hepatic decompensation from alcohol use, often in those with um, history of uh, chronic use. It is characterized by a rapid onset of jaundice, malaise, anorexia, tender hepatomegaly, and future systemic inflammatory response, which we call SIRS. It can range from mild to severe. As I stated earlier, most with acute alcoholic hepatitis tend to have cirrhosis, underlying cirrhosis in about half of the times. And those with severe alcoholic hepatitis actually have significantly increased short-term mortality up to 30 to 50% at three months. Patients, however, with mild disease uh, may have some improvement in their liver function, but they are um, at an increased uh, risk of progressive liver disease or liver injury. Next slide, please. How do we make the diagnosis of acute alcoholic hepatitis? On physical examination, patients may have spider angiomata, palmar erythema, and the li their liver may feel tender as well as enlarged upon palpation. Patients with impaired liver uh, function may have, again, signs of liver decompensation, signs and symptoms of liver decompensation, including hepatic encephalopathy, edema, or ascites. Many patients actually also show signs of malnutrition with muscle atrophy, weakness, and weight loss. On laboratory testing, they often have elevated HT to LT ratio, which is often above 1.5 uh, to 2. Um, but um, this is, transaminases are usually less than 500. They often have elevated bilirubin alkaline phosphate, as well as GGT. They have elevated white count with lymphocytic predominance. Um, liver synthetic function, again, is often impaired with elevated INR in decreased abdomen. They have anemia with macrocytosis, which is typical of alcoholic liver disease. We certainly have to rule out other causes of acute hepatitis. Ultrasound of the abdomen should be performed to rule out um, obstruction of any of the hepatic vasculature. And also, since most have advanced liver disease, liver cancer should um, be ruled out. Patients, again, will give you a classic history of um, chronic and perhaps binge alcohol use right before they got sick. Next slide, please. What is the definition of alcoholic uh, hepatitis? The consensus. A uh, consensus statement from Alcoholic Hepatitis Consortium has provided a working, a working definition of acute alcoholic hepatitis, mostly um, is to <clears throat> define standard elements to identify patients for clinical trial. This definition states that patients with acute alcoholic hepatitis have onset of jaundice within 60 days of heavy alcohol consumption, which is defined as roughly 50 grams per day. Uh, with a minimum of um, um, alcohol use for about six months. Their bilirubin is above 3, AST um, 50 to 400, but like I stated earlier, not above 500. The ratio AST to LT is above 1.5, and obviously we have to rule out other causes of um, um, hepatitis. Um, it's important to note that liver biopsy was not required um, for this definition. Um, it would be nice to see classic findings of acute alcoholic hepatitis on liver biopsy, but those who have comorbid fatty liver disease in NASH, uh, it may be difficult to differentiate that from um, alcoholic hepatitis. Um, there are different models developed to assess the severity of acute alcoholic hepatitis. Um, the discriminant function DF as well as MELD are commonly used, while ABIC and Glasgow Alcoholic Hepatitis Score um, are not used as much. Um, discriminant function is the one of the oldest score and most frequently used. Um, patients that have a discriminant function score above 32 
have a very poor prognosis. And in fact, this is uh, uh, the subgroups that's often identified to consider treatment with a steroid. Note that the determinant function calculation, however, does not include the real function, which is uh, important, particularly in the setting of acute uh, alcoholic hepatitis with risk of hepatorenal syndrome. The MELDI score, which functions equivalent to the discriminant function uh, above 18, a score of above 18 seems to correlate with poor outcome. It's often used, again, to, con to consider patients for liver transplant allocation. The LELI score was developed by the French group um, with semi-complicated formula, but easy online calculation is available. It allows stratification of patients with acute alcoholic hepatitis um, in terms of their response to steroid therapy at day seven. Complete responders will have a score of less than 0 0.1 at, at day seven. Partial responders have a score between 0.16 and 0.56. And non-responders have a score of 0.56 at, again, seven days of, after completing seven days of steroid which correlates with poor outcome with increased risk of mortality. And this is a group where discontinuation of the steroid is recommended. And I will go over that in detail um, on subsequent slides. Next slide, please. What are the available treatment options for acute alcoholic hepatitis? Um, the list includes abstinence, nutrition, corticosteroid, pentoxifilin, liver transplantation, and there are other experimental uh, treatments using N-acetylcysteine and granulocytic colony stimulating factor. Um, I won't review this in details, but they've shown to have some degree of benefit, but not used again routinely. Next slide, please. Abstinence is certainly um, the best therapeutic intervention one can achieve in treating um, any amount of injury, liver injury from al um, alcoholic uh, liver disease. It certainly helps improve liver histologic features of liver injury. It will help reduce portal hypertension. It also decreases the risk of progression to cirrhosis and improves survival. Baclofen, which is a drug that is a GABA agonist, um, it's shown to have some benefit in decreasing craving from alcohol. Uh, there is some data supporting it, it is used. There are additional medications listed down um, that are also helpful in, uh, de in decreasing craving from alcohol that one can consider. Um, people without an underlining um, advanced uh, fibrosis may have improvement of their liver function actually after stopping alcohol within weeks to uh, months. But those that have significant underlying liver disease, though with abstinence, they may still have risk of progression. Um, in general, it's the reporters that af after achieving abstinence, um, the one-year relapse rate can actually range between 67 to 81. And those who have an underlying um, significant fibrosis, if they maintain their abstinence, their survival at five years, one study reported that it's around uh, 75%. Those that have relapsed have a survival rate of 27%. Again, it really depends on their underlying liver disease at the time of um, their initial um, abstinence. In terms of nutrition, again, alcoholic uh, patients with alcoholic liver disease do have significant poorly calorie, protein calorie malnutrition. Generally, enteral nutrition is encouraged with a goal of 35 to 40 kilocalorie per kilogram uh, of a body weight with emphasis on high protein intake with 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of, of body weight per day. Nutrition is shown to confer potential benefits in preserving um, intestinal barriers, decreasing risk of infection. Um, it also may have some immune modulatory effect. It also helps minimize ongoing um, 
muscle loss and if having of advanced delivery disease. Alcoholics tend to have um, deficiencies of vitamin folate as well as um, other nutrients that we have to uh, supplement. Um, studies have shown that nutritional support will help improve liver function, but um, survival benefits compared to um, steroid has not been uh, superior. Next slide, please. Steroids are the most studied pharmacological intervention in treating acute alcoholic hepatitis. They have been evaluated in multiple randomized controlled trials as well as meta-analysis. The standard treatment uh, is often prednisolone um, since there is a decreased conversion of prednisone to prednisolone in those with advanced delivery disease at a dose of 40 milligram per day for about four weeks. Um, some providers may do taper, others will just continue 40 milligram uh, per day uh, for the four week period. This is usually in those patients that have severe acute alcoholic hepatitis with a discriminant function about 32. We also have to be careful um, as there are few contraindications in using the steroid, particularly those with active infection, those with severe hyperglycemia and active GI bleeding. Um, if patients have a discriminant function below 32, i.e. mild to moderate acute alcoholic hepatitis, they will not need a steroid, uh, but additional supportive care, including nutrition and abstinence along with close monitoring is indicated. Next slide, please. This study um, reported um, data, a meta-analysis data using five um, randomized controlled trials that showed that uh, pernizolone again um, used for 28 days in patients with a discriminant function above 32 was able to reduce risk of mortality by 42%. Next slide, please. This study um, reported systematic review of 15 trials, uh, which included 721 patients. Interestingly, on this um, study, steroids actually did not reduce mortality compared to placebo, but when they did subgroup analysis, steroid again were able to decrease mortality and those patients with acute alcoholic hepatitis with discriminant function above 32 and or have hepatic encephalopathy. Um, the reduction, I'm sorry, the difference in mortality was 20% uh, without steroid versus 32%. I'm sorry, 20% was a steroid versus 34% without steroid at six months. Next slide, please. As I stated earlier, the LIL score developed by the French group calculated after patients, re patients receive steroid uh, for seven days. Um, this is, again, patients with acute alcoholic hepatitis with discriminant function above 32. Showed that mortality at six months was higher for those who, are, who have a LIL score above uh, 0.45 than the ones that have below 0.45. Um, the risk of mortality predicted six months the risk of mortality for those that had little score 0.45 was actually 75% at six months. It's recommended that the steroid should be stopped in this group as the risk of ongoing therapy with the steroid overweighs the benefit. Next slide, please. How about if patients can take steroid? What options are available? Um, the other drug that has been used the most is fentoxifilin with some data at 400 milligrams three times per day. Fentoxifilin is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor which inhibits tumor necrosis, necrosis factors that plays a role in liver injury. A randomized controlled trial of patients, 101 patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis that were treated 
with fentoxifiden versus uh, uh, placebo showed that there was a 40% reduction in mortality, but this was attributed to fentoxifiden's role in reducing hepatorenal syndrome. There were sub subsequent meta-analysis, however, uh, that concluded that there was no short-term um, uh, mortality benefit uh, from using fentoxifiden in this setting. There were other um, studies that I did not show today, which showed that fentoxifiden plus prednisone, there was no benefit. And the switching patients that did not do well on prednisone to fentoxifiden subsequently was also not that beneficiary. The study shown here, the SOP AH study, one of the largest study in acute alcoholic hepatitis, it was conducted in the UK. They had 1,003 patients that were enrolled between 2011 and 2014. Their inclusion criteria was, again, those with dysphoria and function above 32. Um, this was a controlled trial. Um, interestingly, to everyone's surprise, it showed that there was no benefit from using fentoxifilin. And there was none significant trend to uh, decreased mortality in using prednisone, as shown here. Um, they also looked at whether or not there was a difference between prednisone and no prednisone, fentoxifilin versus no fentoxifilin at 90 days as well as at one year, and there was no statistical significant benefit. However, even though the p-values were not significant, I can there is enough data also supporting the use of prednisolone, and it remains to be um, the initial uh, treatment of choice in the setting of acute alcoholic hepatitis if patients have a disturbance function above 32 without contraindications to steroid. Next the slide, please. How about liver transplantation in the setting of acute alcoholic hepatitis? Because of it is, again, high mortality, short-term mortality rate, liver transplant may have a potential role as a rescue therapy. As I stated earlier, again, if patients don't respond to steroids, their six-month mortality rate is around 30%. Obviously, for obvious reasons, again, transplanting patients with acute alcoholic hepatitis is very controversial. Uh, one could say that Patients with alcoholic hepatitis are responsible for their illnesses and are likely to resume alcohol uh, after liver transplant. However, we know that that is not true for everyone. It's also difficult to identify really who's at a risk of who has a low risk of recidivism. There is the six months rule that's adapted by most transplant centers as well as pairs now, i.e. Uh, patients are required to be sober for six months with some form of rehab attendance, including AA, before considering liver transplant. However, this rule um, has been, uh, it is currently in question as it may not be um, such a strong predictor of uh, relapse. With, careful selected, with carefully selected patients, however, transplant can again, confer an excellent survival advantage in the setting of acute alcoholic hepatitis, not responding to medical therapy. Um, a study performed in France, again, um, showed that they had 26 patients that were listed for liver transplant after failing um, therapy with the steroid, i.e., they had a little score of 0.45 at day seven. Um, they were controlled, they were compared to case controls uh, and their selection criteria for listing these patients for liver transplant was very rigorous, and the criteria they listed included patient's first episode of liver decompensation, having a favorable psychosocial profile, meaning very stably supportive um, family, no underlying psychiatric disease, agreeing to a lifelong abstinence, and their selection or acceptance for listing has to be agreed by the entire team, which included nurses, fellows, residents, 
addiction medicine specialists, hepatologists, surgeons, as well as anesthesiologists. This group showed that patients that were transplanted had a 77% survival at um, six months compared to 23% survival of, of those that did not get transplanted, which is a huge difference. And their follow-up data next slide showed that, I'm sorry, the slide before that. One slide backward, thank you. They showed that six patients in the transplant group died, and they died within two weeks, mostly related to infection. Particularly, they had, a couple had invasive aspergillus. Um, of those that got transplanted, three out of 26, i.e. 15%, had a relapse. The three of them relapsed, again, farther down after they were transplanted, roughly two years plus. Two remained daily consumers of significant alcohol use versus one um, at the time of publication was using um, occasionally. They had uh, no effect on their graft survival. Again, this study is showing that those that got transplanted had a 77% six-month survival versus 23% of those that did not get transplanted. So this algorithm from a nice review article that I found shows a good approach of a patient with acute alcoholic hepatitis. As I stated earlier, by definition, they have rapid onset of jaundice, impaired liver synthetic function, and recent history of alcohol use. We definitely have to exclude um, other causes of acute liver uh, decompensation. We use the prognostic models to see how sick they are, mostly discriminant function or MELD. Um, those with low risk, again, have a MELD the score of less than 18, discriminant function less than 32. That group does not need a steroid therapy. They will need aggressive nutritional um, supplementation. Uh, that should be assessed with emphasis, making sure that they're taking enough calories as well as protein. Um, they should be managed under supportive care. Um, alcohol rehab program or treatment program should be considered with maintenance of abstinence and they will need regular follow-up as most may have advanced fibrosis and will need to be monitored for liver cancer. Those with high risk, i.e. discriminant function above 32, milled above 18, and may have hepatic encephalopathy. Again, nutritional supplementation with enough calorie and protein. Prednisolone of 40 milligram per day should be considered. This algorithm included in acetylcysteine. There was one study that actually showed the combination had slight benefits. Um, I haven't used it routinely. Um, I don't know if others have. Um, and this algorithm is indicating to consider pentoxifiden if you know if uh, there is a contraindication for steroid. But really, since the uh, stop AH um, control study, the use of pentoxifiden has declined as they re really has not been shown to have significant benefit in a controlled study. Uh, responders, we should calculate the liver score right at day seven. I'm sorry, after day seven, um, i.e., the calculation is actually done on day eight, day eight after completing seven days of uh, prednisolone treatment. If patients have a score above 0.45, we should definitely discontinue prednisolone as they use will have more complications than benefits. And um, this algorithm states consider liver transplant evaluation. If, again, they are at the center where this may be uh, considered. Next slide, please. In terms of liver transplantation in the setting of alcoholic liver disease, again, in the U.S., alcoholic liver disease is actually one of the major indications for liver transplantation, which accounts for 20% of all liver transplants transplant performed here. As I mentioned earlier, major transplant center impairs are requiring the six months sobriety rule, 
with enrollment to AA or other equivalent alcohol rehab program. The six months rule is really not hard and fast, um, but has been shown in earlier studies that uh, patients that are sober for at least six months have decreased risk of recidivism, but this can be debated, and there are other studies subsequent, subsequently questioning that it actually may not be that good in predicting recidivism. Additionally, I think six months will allow us for some uh, recovery of uh, alcohol-related liver injury, therefore, um, if there is significant improvement, liver transplant may not be needed. Recidivism in general after um, transplant has been reported in that range between 16 to 49 percent based on different studies. Um, a small percentage of, of uh, transplants done after I'm sorry, a small percentage of patients that are transplanted for alcoholic liver disease may return to excessive uh, drinking. Last slide, please. So in summary, um, as shown in a national survey in reports from the WHO, there is a significant health burden of alcohol use worldwide. Pernesolone 40 mg per day for four weeks may represent the most viable treatment option for acute alcoholic hepatitis, though as I stated, the stoppage trial suggested the survival benefit was marginal. We really have to be careful and vigilant about infection, and we also have to make sure to stop the pernesolone if uh, the little score is above 0.45. At, um, after seven days of therapy. Liver transplantation, while controversial, again, is um, a treatment option for selected patients with acute alcoholic hepatitis with significant mortality benefit. Again, decision to transplant is center dependent um, and is variable. Um, um, in the last uh, couple of years, I think many liver transplant centers in the U.S. Um, have been moving towards being open to considering patients for liver transplant, even though they have not been sober um, uh, for six months. Um, thanks for uh, uh, listening to my presentation, and I will um, have, I think, Victoria, uh, Victoria would be uh, moderating our questioning and answer session. I'm sorry, Veronica would be monitoring our question and answer session. Well, actually, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Veronica has had to um, leave us, um, and we're because our, our uh, we're over our time limit right now. We're going to be posting answers to your questions um, along with the slides that uh, each of our presenters have made tonight. Uh, on our website at liverfoundation.org, we'll be sending you each uh, an email to a link uh, with a link to that page where you can uh, view the recording, uh, download the slides, and um, uh, see the answers to the questions that you've submitted through the uh, the chat window. Um, so just to uh, uh, give you a little bit of uh, um, overview on some resources available. Um, the American Liver Foundation website is liverfoundation.org, where you can find uh, an abundance of information. Um, the Northern California Division website of the American Liver Foundation can be found at liverfoundation.org, ALF, Northern California. We have a helpline where uh, patients can call at any time, um, 1-800-GO-LIVER or 465-4837. And you can download um, brochures and informational materials um, on our website as well um, at uh, our resources area. Um, and as I mentioned, um, our uh, webinar will be is recorded and will be posted out on liverfoundation.org. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening and our speakers as well. Um, we appreciate your time, and uh, thank you, and good evening. Thank you.
Thank you.